AARP cares deeply about this issue of elder abuse. It's one of our top priorities. When we saw the video of you, Dr. Johnson, you know, we were very, uh, it was heartfelt and it was really difficult to watch because what we understand at AARP is that we see that elder abuse is become a very tragic and public health crisis today. And too many people are being abused and not enough people are aware of the issue of elder abuse. It's one of these hidden epidemics. And so at ARP, our mission is really to help people age with dignity. And it has been one of our top priorities at the Minnesota Legislature. Last year, we worked very, very hard to get increased funding to the Department of Health to do more on regulating uh, nursing homes and assisted living to prevent elder abuse. We have an incident. Dr. Josie Johnson was a victim of elder abuse um, in an Uber and we're going to address that we're going to hear her story and we're going to bring you into this world that you may not know that exists in our community so i want to welcome dr josie johnson to the show thank you monique you're welcome it is you have no idea what a honor it is to be engaged in something that you've defined as important something that deals with our condition as we age, the elders, what does that mean? And I'm happy and yet sad to share the story. So let me tell you a bit about it and I'll try to abbreviate it, but also give you the flavor and the sense of what happened. First of all, I had no idea that our community would be able to respond the way it has. Last June, uh, my plans for that afternoon were to go to my godchild's graduation. And we were making arrangements for that and my usual method of transportation was not available that afternoon. So my godchild, who used a service, Uber Transportation, suggested that we call Uber and have them come get me. She did the arrangement. Well, I'd never done this. I'd never been in a public transportation before. So this was, this was new for me. So I went down to my lobby. I live in a condominium went to my lobby and waited for the driver. The driver came. I went to the car and said, are you Uber? The, the driver never looked at me, didn't really respond. My assumption was that it was Uber since he said no. So we uh, got in the car and I said, uh, do you know where we're going? I said, this is my first time using this service, so I don't know the procedure. Do you know where I am going? And he never answered. He continued to look straight ahead. And as we were making the curve in my drive area, I said, young man, I just need to know, do you know where we're going? Because I don't know. My godchild made the arrangement. He never answered. So as we continued down that little area, I said, is everything OK? Are you all right? He never answered. He never looked in my direction. So he d didn't know the person he was looking at woman, young, old, that's my assumption. So after a while, and we were about to exit my drive area, he stopped the car and he said, you may get out. And I said, oh really? 
And he said, yes. Never looked. He's still looking straight ahead. So I said, okay. So I opened the door to the, uh, to the door to the rear of the car and attempted to step out. And when I did, the heel of my shoe got caught in the drain because we were right at the drain at the exit of the exit. And I fell. He didn't look or ask questions or anything. And so I fell. I'm trying to get up and fell again. And he drove off. And he made a left turn out of the drive. I had fallen on the right side. And the suggestion of, of some after hearing the story was that if he had turned right instead of left, he might have run, run over, over me. You. Yes. Well, I got up. I was embarrassed and surprised and didn't quite know what I had done to cause that kind of reaction. So I, I got up eventually, straightened myself off, put my shoe on, and then walked back into my building and called my godchild and told her that it hadn't worked out. I didn't go into details with her. I just said the driving plan did not work. So she said, what happened? I said, when you, later on I'll tell you. She said, well, I'll call another. So then she called the Lyft organization. Mm -hmm. They came and got me. And when I told our community, mm -hmm. one of our people, Tyrone Terrell, who was a young man that I know, who is a young man that I know very well, Tyrone then organized the community to come to the Urban League office and hear my story. So and, and that's one how thing, it happened. Sure. One thing I wanted to um, give credit to, you also had a local film producer. Yeah that was critical in obtaining the video footage. He was, it's a very, it, all of this is such an interesting process because the community assembled when Tyrone called them <coughs> and we met at the Urban League to hear my story. Well, my young friend, uh, Pete Rhodes, who is the photographer you're talking about, was among those people who came. Pete then became very interested in this and talked to me about what had happened. He then came to my building. And it's an interesting thing because the management of my building, I don't think had used a tape, a video, mm -hmm. right? Is mm -hmm. that what you're, That's right. Or recorded things like that. They probably do it, but right. I mean, share it. This was the surveillance video. That's surveillance. normally the security video. That's exactly right. right. Well, Pete came to the building the very next morning, talked to the manager, and they went on their system and found the video. Which was extraordinary because extraordinary. what I heard was that it was going to be destroyed. The next day, the next day. was the date That's for right. the destruction of that particular exactly. month or right. whatever right. the period is. He was able to get it, got permission from the uh, management mm -hmm. of our building mm -hmm. to use it. And then he brought his niece to my unit a few days later and we taped and that's my right. conversation. He interviewed me. She interviewed and taped my conversation sure. about what had happened. So that's how it became public. And we'll we'll make all of this available on our um, website. Okay. We'll have all of this information available. What I heard from you is there's this great culture in our community that activated based on and absolutely and and that's what's incredible about this campaign because this campaign is definitely it's a it's a grassroots campaign and we really want to not only get to the bottom of of 
your situation, but we want to make this community safe for all elders. And it was our black community that came immediately. Right, right. I couldn't get over that. Which is beautiful. All he did was invite. <clears throat> I called the community together. They came. They came. And they became very alarmed and concerned about it. And, all, and what that did was to remind us there are a lot of our That's right. black elders out there who need protection and for us to be aware of the kind of insults and the kind of treatment they receive. My children, for example, said, Mother, I am so glad. A driver like that could put you out in the middle of the street. That's right. In the winter. That's right. In the snow. So to have a community respond was a blessing. And I'm very grateful for that. And we're so grateful that he didn't turn right. He turned left. That's right. Because we are grateful that you can be here to tell this story. And I'm grateful to be able to do that. And I thank all of my brothers and sisters, my elders, who have experienced abuse yes. of all kinds. And we know what's happening. And we need to right. be. That's why the alertness of what you're doing. There are many programs out there paying attention to us. The more, the better. That's right. And we believe <coughs> the, the initiative, this is the education for the community because we believe that this is a problem that we in our community can solve. And we often don't know. That's right. That others are suffering this. That's right. We don't often share it. That's pretty embarrassing. It is. I remember how I felt right. when I got up and got my shoe back That's on. That's right. Sort of look around to see, did anyone see you? Right, right. It's an embarrassing. You so, feel very yes. personally injured exactly, by it. Exactly, exactly. Well, we thank you for sharing this story with us. and. The um, Minnesota Elder Nonviolence Coalition is about teaching this as a way of living in our community, to respect elders, it's to respect. It's a community that's going to, it's an initiative that's going to engage youth because the youth are our future right. and we need them to carry this message forward. And so often we don't freely share. Um, and our community is, at, with this help and with all the other groups that are out there calling attention to us. Yes. I'm 88, soon 89. And you wonder, what does that mean in the larger community? That's right. So if you're able to share, be alert that there are our elders out there that are suffering all kinds, not only from the historical mm -hmm. supremacy right. attitude about us, black elders, but to know the history of our black elders, of taking care of our children. That's right. And our uh, community, being conscious, and, and we have to learn it's okay to share those sad stories but it's okay that's right. and our children need to know about them that's right and so they can act well thank you well thank, thank you. you it's very whoever thought that you'd be able to organize this way monique i thank you for being sensitive to it my community i was i couldn't believe how responsive they were well it's such an a honor respect for the legacy that you have in our community. You've always been that uh, supporter and love of community. You have fought many battles I've been in our community. I've been and blessed with parents who taught us and a community that works with you. They love you. They too have experience with their elders, want to protect them, absolutely. care about them. So we're lucky, and what a moment to be able to talk together Absolutely. and share well, and be okay. Absolutely. Right. Well, thank so you. I thank you. Thank you very much. On behalf of all of us, 
uh, behalf of our cultural richness of the elders, thank you. You are we so welcome. It. You are so welcome. Yeah. We're going to hear from Professor Mahmoud El Khadi, who is a lecturer and expert on African American history and culture. Uh, we're going to bring him on set right after this break. Hi, I'm Carly. And I'm Jesse, inviting you to listen to our new podcast that shines a spotlight on a major problem in our community, elder abuse. You can listen on iTunes to our podcast, sponsored by the Minnesota Elder Nonviolence Coalition. Get involved at mnelderonviolence.org. That's mnelderonviolence.org. Thank you for tuning in to Minnesota Elder Nonviolence Coalition. Our initiative is to shine a spotlight, a big bright spotlight on uh, elder abuse that is going on um, greatly in our community. We're here with a special guest and dear friend of Dr. Josie Johnson, Mahmoud El Khadi, and he's a just a great community, huge community leader, author, lecturer, and an expert on African American studies. We're going to talk to him, and he's going to share with us how he felt when he heard about this incident with his dear friend. Mahmoud, oh, how yes. are you, and um, welcome to our show. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here. Yeah, I was uh, pained um, when I heard that, and I attended the meeting where the community people showed up. You know, I was hurt in I don't know how many ways, but that's another story. Um, I want to disabuse you of the notion that I'm an expert, though. <laughs> you know, an, an expert is somebody who knows everything okay. about one thing <laughs> and something about everything else. <laughs> well, I, don't, I don't think there are any experts on people. Okay. But if I could be an expert, it, given my relationship to Josie, that would be close. Okay. I'm saying I've known her most of my life. When never had a dearer friend. I don't. I can't recall being that close. And that uh, young lady um, that she was talking about, her goddaughter, happens to be my daughter. So I'm, she's known Josie all of her life, and she was very upset. That's mm -hmm. what upset me was her uh, and uh, well that's where we are now okay that was a terrible bad thing but you can learn good things from bad things and it's, it can be instructive for us to talk about culture about us as a people I insist that black people in the United States of America are a people mm -hmm. Just like Jews, or we were in in Africa, same color, or Yoruba, how we are a people, not a race. We are we are a culture. We are a history, you know, because we are produced by history. Culture is the way people behave, what they value, what they believe, their habits, their customs, their mores. I'm sorry, I had to say this, but. I'm compelled to say it because too many of us don't really know what culture is. You think it's pop culture. <laughs> That's not what it is. It's something deep and visceral about a people. And it don't come about as a flag. It's, well, the point is, <laughs> um, our culture produced this lady as it produced me and you and about 50 million other people who are in the United States of America, uh, that's how many, I think, who would come under the rules of being black or African American. And so with about 50 million people. And by that I mean the black, brown, beige, light, bright, almost white people <laughs> who've been called Negroes. You know, we, we know we're not Negroes now. We'll get that straight. To talk, I have to say this in order to talk about culture. You know, culture is is who people are, not how they look. And it's a complex of things that makes us a people. These black people in the United States, these abused people by this racist criminal system. Let me be very clear on that. Um, 
that's that's who we are, and uh, I think we are a loving people. I think that, that the black people, in so far as respect for the elders, are the last people to lose this reverence for the elders mm -hmm. in this country. Sure. As bad as we talked about and what we been taught to think about ourselves. See, I'm a grandma's baby. I might be an expert on that. Yeah. <laughs> I might be. You know, I, I was very close to my grandmother. She shaped my formative years. Mm. Not my mother, not my father. My, I had a mother and father, like, but my grandmother was the one who shaped me. I carry her values with me to this very day. So, um, um, it, nothing is made the way people behave toward my grandmother you know, with, with a certain kind of reverence and respect and so forth. She had a lot of young friends. I, mean, I can remember a guy named Bubba. Mm -hmm. Well, a rather guy in the South named Bubba. Yes, right. saying, That's right. We had a lot of Bubba. Bubba. <laughs> Whether you're black or white, you better be Bubba. Bubba. That's right. Bubba. Clinton's name was Bubba Clinton. That's you know, so <laughs> by the time I was 10 years old, I knew at least 10 guys named Bubba. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, uh, but that relationship between her and George Jackson was mm. just fascinating. I was mm. a child, like seven, eight, nine, ten years old, who went to Howard University and became a successful pharmacist. Okay. And I met him later in life. Yeah. So I'm, I, I have a spe special thing about the elderly, and I'm one of them now, <laughs> although I don't act like it. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not. I'm more than look like it, but I don't act like it. Um, yeah, we were upset, and we yeah. we turned and, and had a right to be, because there were people, and I'm not the only one who felt this. We had grandmothers and stuff like that. We've always had a reverence for age. That's a leftover African value. You mm -hmm. can see this. Mm -hmm. Anybody who's came through, as the old folks used to say, who came through before about the mid to late '60s, when our culture shifted radically because. We wanted to be free. <laughs> that's what that's all about. And uh, some things did change, you know. And we live in a society uh, which is, uh, in terms of its makeup and its value, is a, a youth worshiping. Uh, uh, we have this thing about everybody being 16 years old. You know, mm -hmm. the media tell us that we are a youth worshiping society and we are a, uh, uh, a celebrity worshiping society and an anti aging society. That's mm -hmm. a new value on right, black right. people. That's not our values. We, we, and looking at pop culture and television and People talking to their mamas like, you know, they're 16 years old. That's not our background. Mm -hmm. And I, I, there's a television show sure. I hated. It had one of my favorite stars in it. Uh, and they were white people in the show. But the girl treated her mother like she was a pal, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, and, t and, 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 you know, all but cussed her out. And it just upset me. Because <laughs> I'm not familiar with these values. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't understand that. Uh, and I'm not unusual. <laughs> you know, a lot of black people feel like me, a good number of black people. You don't do that. You have reverence for age. You don't. Right, right. Those are the historians before, before, before writing became widespread. They are, there's a words thrown around among black people. I don't think they know what it means. Grio. <laughs> is the keeper right, right. of the history, of the family, of the culture. That's what a griot is in Africa. G-R-I-O-T. Okay. Now, griot. A griot is, 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 it's your history before the printed word took over. That's and even after the printed word. So he's, the, 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 the elders are the historians. The elders are the gatekeepers of values, of beliefs, of customs, of mm -hmm. habits, of mores, mm -hmm. and so forth. That's what it, for everybody, for all human beings. Right, right. Uh, reverence for age is not exclusively African, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. but it's more pronounced among African sure. people. Wow. So when you f have those kinds of feelings, you get especially upset. Uh, that's just it, you're human. And it's a value that, it, it values which shaped our, our culture. 
is, 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 is profound uh, uh, in terms of, of, of the reverence that we have for those who have come before us and even after us and gone. It's not what it was, but it's still there as evidenced mm -hmm. by the response to what happened uh, to Josie Johnson. So we're at the crossroads. Our culture has changed, and it's changing. And yet it's still the same. It's still the same. <laughs> See, that's the yeah. paradox. That's why <laughs> I, I am same. never going to lose hope. I want to get back to that that you what? described so eloquently here today. Mm -hmm. And that's our goal, and that's, um, that's something that we're going to do a well, lot of talking well, about. Well, well, some people are, are, are trying to recapture some of these right. things. You know, a value that's come back to our community in another form, an old, it's, it's nearly in every African society, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it, it, it directly comes out of one of the West African societies, is that uh, no family can raise a child all by itself. Right. It takes a village. That's where that comes that's from. That's where it comes from. But the from. next thing you know sure. is the, it's the caption of a book by uh, the ex uh, President's wife, right? Mm -hmm. Edelman mm -hmm. is the lady who brought that to Clinton. Mm -hmm. you know, okay. She puts it in a book. <laughs> See, that's, that's how black people are treated. Like she wouldn't even give her credit for it. You know, it's an right. African value. Sure. But it drove white people crazy because sure. they said, what do you mean it takes a village? That's, no, this is individualism and that kind of crazy sure, stuff. Sure. You know, it's a clash of values. Right now, growing on between white and black people, not because they are of different races, but they're produced by different experiences. Right. You, know, you know, some of the things that we're taking a look at is, um, of course, with this cultural conversation, is that part of the care for elders, how much of what they're experiencing today is because certain services lack understanding of their culture, of the culture. Absolutely. So we're going to do a lot of discussion on this very subject. Yeah, and so it, it really is. It's really important. Thank you for being with us today. So we're going to take a, a break now. We're going to move into a segment where we're going to talk about what is elder ab abuse. And we have another one of the Minnesota Elder Nonviolence Coalition supporters here today. Uh, we have Sean Burke who is from Minnesota Elder Justice Center. And did we know that they did so much work on this subject? So you're gonna hear from him right after we come back from this break. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the Minnesota Elder Nonviolence Coalition. We are here today with a special guest from the Minnesota Elder Justice Center. Sean Burke is here, and he's going to talk about the true definition of elder abuse. What exactly is elder abuse? Welcome to the show, Sean. Thank you, Monique. It's been great to spend time with you talking um, on this subject because there truly is a lot to learn. We talk about elder abuse in all forms, and it is great to have you tell our audience exactly what that means. Yeah, um, I am very happy to be here and very happy to be a, a part of this initiative in our offices very excited that there is this public awareness grassroots campaign uh, happening. Uh, the way we like to describe elder abuse is somewhat fairly simple, but it gets complex quickly. It is really kind of the knowing uh, abuse. Sometimes that's physical, sometimes that's emotional, psychological, uh, of an older or vulnerable adult. It also includes neglect. Um, lots of abuse happens, unfortunately, at the hands of loved ones and caregivers. And neglect occurs when those caregivers uh, f fail to do their duty. And it also happens, unfortunately, and probably most commonly in what we call financial exploitation. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is uh, the stealing or the taking of an older adult's money or resources, oftentimes through manipulation or mm -hmm. deception or some sort of fraud. And again, unfortunately, while that does happen in scams, it happens at the hands of our loved ones and our family members as well. 
And mm -hmm. Sean, your your background, so you're you're an attorney. I am. And you are regularly on the front lines of fighting in, in this legislation and creating laws and uh, around elder abuse. Yeah, and I'm not alone. We actually have uh -huh. a lot of great partners in our state. Um, mm -hmm. We have uh, the real boots on the ground folks we have is when abuse happens in the community. So uh, from what you experienced, Dr. Josie, or unfortunately when it happens in our own homes, um, we have adult protective services that exist in our state. Uh, you can think of it kind of like child protection, mm -hmm. um, but they are woefully underfunded compared mm -hmm. to child protection. And it's a service and a system that, uh, frankly, we haven't built up the infrastructure that we need uh, to face, especially the growing older population. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are our boots on the ground, and, and we need to find ways to support them more um, through funding um, and through better resources. We also have folks uh, known as the Ombudsman's Office uh, for long-term care. Mm -hmm. When abuse happens in facilities, long-term mm -hmm. care facilities like assisted mm -hmm. living or like nursing homes, uh, the Ombudsman's Office can help uh, and respond as well. Uh, we also have state agencies that come and look uh, when abuse is reported and, and investigate it. But our goal uh, as a center is to make sure we're also looking at root causes of, of abuse and trying to stop it before it starts, mm -hmm. prevention. Right. And that's trickier uh, because right. we know sure. elder abuse, like other forms of abuse, intimate partner violence, domestic violence, child abuse, it's really a public health problem. Right. And so right. we have to look at it holistically, mm -hmm. not just uh, victims, but also uh, their families and their support structure. And in the case of, of elder abuse, because it happens so much um, from caretakers, unfortunately, we need to better understand uh, why that abuse happens. Mm -hmm. Numbers wise, unfortunately, we know that uh, adults in America over the age of 60, about one in 10 will experience that form of, of mm. abuse, wow. neglect, financial exploitation. And if you have a cognitive disability, like mm. Alzheimer's or another form of dementia, that's one in five. Mm. And with our aging population, you can quickly do, you know, back of the napkin math, that is mm. a lot of people in our country wow. mm. and also a lot of perpetrators. We also know, unfortunately, that elder abuse is underreported. And Dr. Josie, you've spoken very eloquently about the shame um, in the incident uh, that you felt. And we know that shame is one of the root causes about why uh, older adults are hesitant to report what happened to them. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they also don't know that what happened to them is abuse um, mm -hmm. or, and perhaps have grown up in a family dynamics where you know it's just quote unquote the way things are done. Mm -hmm. um, and we need to change that cycle and give older adults uh, and the community the language and the permission to talk about mm -hmm. uh, abuse and older uh, elder abuse uh, for what it is. Um, and then we also know people don't know where to report. It mm -hmm. gets really confusing. Right, and right. those resources I talked about a little bit ago, you know, um, they can only help so many people. Mm -hmm. And so um, what our office does is we provide a helpline and we get many calls a day and we help sometimes older adults or oftentimes their family members. Something happened, maybe an incident like you described, maybe it is an incident that they're experiencing in their own home or in a mm -hmm. facility and mm -hmm. they don't know where to go. Okay. And so we help them kind of make a game plan uh, and find some resources that will help them. Sometimes it's an attorney, sometimes it's another caregiver, sometimes it's a report that they need to make. Um, and then we also help them kind of make a game plan uh, about what to do next and how to pick up the pieces. Uh, and so we are one small piece of the puzzle right, right. about all the other boots on the ground going sure. to try to work on this problem. Well, you know, one of the things that that is encouraging to me as far as knowledge and awareness is to hear the, uh, the fact that families want to put in the area where their family members are uh, televisions mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. s because they have a sense mm -hmm. right. that that helps that to abuse. control exactly. some of the abuse. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think that when we talk about abuse, Sometimes, as you've identified, we're not fully conscious mm -hmm. of what abuse is. Right. And there are some things that maybe we as elders assume are needed exactly. to help us. And right. we don't realize that we're being taken advantage or harmed mm -hmm. and don't know it. And don't know what to do don't know about what it, to do even about if it, it occurs. Right. One of the things I was thinking too when you mentioned the um, financial exploitation, mm -hmm. yeah. which is very common, mm -hmm. 
um, there are numbers and we'll put all these numbers again up on our uh, website but there's another side of it so and I'm talking about more the systemic nature of how the system works because if you are an elder that requires assistant living or or um, nursing care what I'm hearing from elders is that, the, that they literally have to give up everything in order to yeah. get the care, everything that they've worked for all their life. Right. So this, the expo financial exploitation seems like it's from all ends. Exactly. So, you know, the, in advocacy, you're advocating for system change, policy change, preventive. It's all of these things that require immediate attention, in my opinion. No, you're exactly right. I, uh, you know, one of the specific points you just mentioned is the lack of a really solid public infrastructure to take care of all sorts of individuals in our society. But we know that as you age in this country, unf unfortunately, the numbers of poverty increases right. uh, and the amount that you um, have to live on right. increases. And so the growing number of uh, poor, mm -hmm. um, older adults is another risk factor uh, to right. abuse uh, and neglect as well in getting that, those services. Oh, yeah. It, you know, the yeah. other, uh, another key point that I think that you touched on a little bit that makes elder abuse, especially financial exploitation, in some ways somewhat different than some of the other family abuses um, and some of the other uh, interpersonal violence is that unlike children, especially young children, um, older adults, even if they're uh, having some cognitive capacity issues, they are autonomous human beings. Mm -hmm. They're individuals who right. should make decisions That's on their right. own. And so family sure. members sometimes face really difficult situations mm -hmm. when you have an older adult who may be being talked into things right. uh, right. or uh, by a loved one or by a scam artist. Right. And when they're approached and said, you know, what you're doing is wrong. Well, I'm, I'm a human being. I'm making this choice. That's it's right. my choice. That's right. And that balance between autonomy and safety, mm -hmm. uh, which the camera issue also touches on, mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. a really delicate one and right. really tough right. and it adds another dynamic, but we have to deal with that mm -hmm. because sure. if we only think about it as safety only, mm -hmm. then we start touching on some of the ageism um, right. issues mm -hmm. where we just assume Absolutely. that older adults are people to just take care of. That's mm -hmm. right. And yet, if we don't focus on safety <laughs> and don't have some protective layer, mm -hmm. um, then we are also mm -hmm. missing and, and making vulnerable of uh, that population so our office right. works really hard to make sure that that balance wow. between safety and autonomy um, is part of the equation as well and that's a very yeah. delicate balance it is, it is. really it is. is because you're right as we grow older whereas we accept the care that we need from our family members sometimes it makes you feel inadequate right and right. you wonder you know, you don't want to bother people. You don't want to ask for help. Sometimes you are an independent soul who hasn't had help, mm -hmm. hasn't needed mm -hmm. help. Mm -hmm. And suddenly you are in need of it, but right. you don't recognize it as this transition from the independence mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. need of help. Wow. And you think about the number of elders who accept what this environment may offer at that moment mm -hmm. and you're grateful for right. it so right. you don't even know sometimes you're not being treated the way you should be or you're not being encouraged to think about what is care and what's abuse exactly and we read right. so much don't right. we and i'm so happy to hear your voice because we are talking about a population. We're growing older. There are medicines now that prolong our life. Right, right. <laughs> and so we're here and things are happening. The society is changing. Mm -hmm. People are different. Mm -hmm. They are. Systems are different. That's right. We're having to learn a whole new way of thinking about laws and policy and the issue that you raised that I think is so critical, I haven't had a chance to visit with Mahmoud about this or any of my elder friends, but the fact that in order for us to get the kind of care that we need, we have to give up everything. Mm -hmm. 
if we're going to move into right. an assisted living facility, mm -hmm. you have to be destitute. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, to, to be on public benefits, you to be have, on or spend all of the money that you've earned that over you've time. Earned. And sometimes that's actually the uh, precipitating factor for family financial exploitation. Right. Because the younger generation will see that happening and will say, wait a second, that was going to be my money. Right. And that sense of entitlement, right. which we know right. unfortunately drives a lot Absolutely. of that right. later financial exploitation, it kicks in and all sorts of um, stuff you know, shenanigans, frankly, can start to happen mm -hmm. around that. Um, and, and that is bad in and of itself, but you've hit on the larger cultural issue is, do we really value um, folks with uh, disabilities and right. older adults who need right. that kind of long-term care? Right. Because frankly, the private insurance system has failed uh, to was... really fill the gap. And so we rely on public benefits to pay so much of our long-term care. Exactly. We will have to rethink that. And how do we handle that? How does the community look at that? So what do we mean by in need of public assistance mm -hmm. for me? Sure. If I need to move from where I live to a place where people can come in and check on me mm -hmm. and I'm in an assisted living facility, mm -hmm. who pays for that? Do I then take everything I've ever had in my savings account or does mm -hmm. Social Security take it? How do we discuss that? At what level? Which might be You're a future right. important conversation. I, it, it's probably going on now. It is. And okay. actually what you touched on is actually one of the tools of prevention that we encourage and that uh, we, we hope will gain more traction is early, earlier planning earlier. <laughs> early planning earlier. Uh, because all of those questions around who's going to take care of me, you know, legally we call that kind of your estate uh, and, and probate matters. Um, but, in, and oftentimes people do that kind of secretively and then tell their kids later or never tell their kids and then their kids have to find out about it after something happens. Mm -hmm. I think the sooner that conversation can happen, um, the more in the open it can be, um, while it can be uncomfortable, is actually a means of prevention because then it's being talked about right. and wishes are being talked about. And reality sure. is starting to set in. Yeah. If you're doing the math and said, well, we can't afford this, then we're going to have to plan for this rather than waiting for something to happen exactly. then reacting. So, right. so this plan that you have introduced sure. um, is, is a topic for discussion. Absolutely education mm -hmm. and and I wish we had more time <laughs> that we could keep going but this is not the end of the conversation here so part of this initiative we're going to have these community events and go out and talk to you you're going to be able to actually talk to to Sean about these very questions so we will have a lot of events around the in the community because this is very critical mm -hmm. and it sounds like you said it earlier it's really complex, mm -hmm. and so there's a lot that um, elders want to know. They don't know. They they may not know exactly what you just said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This advice on how to plan ahead mm -hmm. right. to prevent some of these things from happening, which will put them in a really bad place, like you said, impoverished, impoverished, and um, losing everything that they work so hard for. And your sense of the peoplehood. Yes. You just it's the dignity, yeah. the dignity. dignity of, of and carrying old. forward the cu cu cultural training. Exactly. How do we share that? That's right. So that the community appreciates the African culture of our people who take care of their right. elders. And that's another area we're going to dig into because when you're going out and you're looking for, let's say, cultural specific care, that's and that's right. what I hear from a lot of elders. Right. It's you can't find it. That's right. And that understanding. So I wish we could be here longer, but we're at the end of uh, the, this segment. We're going to keep talking about this. Yes. And that's what Minnesota Elder Nonviolence Coalition is all about. Next coming up, we are going to be joined by the youth. The youth are going to lead this conversation in the community. We have two youth, Carly and Jesse, who are the hosts of our Mink. When we say Mink, we mean Minnesota Elder Nonviolence Coalition. They're the host of the podcast that we will be unveiling and launching. So tune in. We'll be right back.
Hi, I'm Carly. And I'm Jesse, inviting you to listen to our new podcast that shines a spotlight on a major problem in our community, elder abuse. You can listen on iTunes to our podcast, sponsored by the Minnesota Elder Nonviolence Coalition. Get involved at mnelderonviolence.org. That's mnelderonviolence.org. Welcome back to Minnesota Elder Nonviolence Coalition. And we're here with the youth. We have youth that are launching our podcast. We have Jesse and Carly, and we're gonna have some fun and talk to the youth. Thank you, welcome back, thank you. Hi guys, hi. So Jesse, why don't you tell us a little bit about you and, I, and, and a little bit about your buttons. I notice you're wearing a lot of buttons. Yeah. Um, <laughs> buttons Connect, it's a brand that I've had for, since I was nine years old, I've been sewing buttons. Oh my. Yeah, and uh, it's just a symbol to represent Anything that's divided is connected with the button. And so, but I'm a writer as well. So I just love taking information, utilizing that information for the benefit of paradise clarity is something I like to call it. Um, a place where we all can understand each other and not be so judgmental. So I write until the pen runs out and I sew just to represent the stories that are told throughout fashion. <laughs> All right, and Carly, Carly. My name's Carly, and Jesse and I will be doing a podcast to talk about um, the just bringing awareness to the Elder Abuse Coalition that, um, it, I mean, it is a big problem, and we definitely want to educate not only ourselves, but other people, and even I think it's important for the youth to know about it and how to define it, how to recognize it, and how to stop it. And so I think it's really important, especially for us and even myself, a recent college graduate, um, for people that want to go into health care and other things to recognize these issues and be able to have conversations about it. And so that's why we're here today. So yeah. Carly, what is a podcast? Yes, so a podcast, it's an audio recording of, um, you know, you can put in interviews, just it's a conversation. And so similar to the radio, but you can access it online and other things, but. So it's yeah. visual? No, it's an audio recording. Okay. Yep. All yes. right. Thank you. Yes. All right. Do you have any other Well, questions? you know, yes. the question that I guess I have and how happy I am that our youth are interested in participating and having a conversation mm -hmm. about this because you're then carrying on yes. in the tradition of your ancestors. Mm -hmm. Right, Mahmoud? The whole idea of carrying on, being concerned, being able to express the concern in a way that's helpful to us <laughs> to know what our children are thinking about elder care. What do they think that means? I'd like to say one last thing, too, and about youth. Don't let anybody kid you. All of this stuff that we live around and with and practically thingified ourselves, you know, as Martin Luther King would say, we are a thingified society. Uh, you know, we've learned to love things and use people. And we want to flip the script. Learn to love people first and use things. Uh, and nothing, no thing is more important than you. I think the, all, the, 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 the most valuable thing that any society, any culture, any people, any nation, however you're going to find large groups of people uh, who share something in common is that The most valuable thing in any given society, the wealth of any society is inherent in youth and young people. It's really not ten heaps called Cadillacs and Mercedes Benzes and ten room houses with swimming pool is youth. The only wealth that any human being, any society has is youth. They're the one, the young, the coming. That's real wealth. 
an automobile is not real wealth. It's a thing. It's made, destroyed. People make things. Things don't make people. You got that? Okay. We End can of discussion. See if that's how our youth see how they want to interact with the project of nonviolence to youth. Have you thought much about what that means? I have. Um, I think it's important to acknowledge the youth while we are the future. The whole thing is a cycle. We're going to all go through birth, our teens, you know, the middle 20s, late 20s to the 30s until, you know, we just constantly evolve. And I think understanding that that evolving is due with responsibility and we have to know how to communicate with those who are older, understanding that our ancestors and everyone, uh, we are all a part of the fabric, so we have to understand each other. And the best way I can think of it is just informing all of my friends and homies, letting them know, hey, you know, we're all in this together. We got to know how to communicate with each other and just be, digni be dignified. You guys mentioned dignity earlier, and I think that's very important. Yes, I mean, it's definitely important to take care of each other, you know, it, we are a community and recognizing the problems, um, I mean, we all want it to be a better place all the time and so I think it's definitely important to bring awareness to this problem. I mean, even just think about it being a family member, a friend, and even not just that, even that personal, but it's a human being, it's someone that should be getting the proper care and attention that anyone else should. So. I think it's definitely important to talk about it. Yeah. Wow, what a, what a great way to end the show today. It was so powerful when you describe youth as wealth, that equating that, which it's so, wow, it's so, so real because that is, that's truth. So in mm -hmm. your sense, when we think about our youth being an active in, ingredient in this, are we saying, they will select the people that you will interview who represent your age group, your interest group, to get some notion. I think it would be really cool to go around into the community, reaching out to others to talk to um, victims of elder abuse, family members, healthcare professionals, um, just to hear their stories and um, just to learn a bit more. I think it's always important to hear from a personal experience, um, but then adding in the research that goes into it as well and what we can do to end um, elder abuse going on. What made you just kind of talking? Why are you interested in it? <laughs> well, um, I mean, recently, um, I guess the experience with my grandmother, you know, she was in a nursing home, and mm -hmm. that was really my first time being in that um, setting and just seeing, like, it's so important for them. You know, you're at your last, um, you know, stages of your life, and it's so important to have the proper care and, um, like, all that attention, really all the tending that they need. Um, and of course, it's my grandmother. We want the best for her, so. And one thing um, I think is important, what we heard Sean talk about is we have this silent community that is not talking. They're not going to go to the system and report the abuse because the abuse may have come from a family member. Mm -hmm. And I think by having the youth go in, I think we'll, we'll be able to understand it without making them feel like they're telling on a family member and they're gonna get in trouble. And I think just, you know, being able to hear these stories and, and add that cultural layer to the story that this is about loving and taking care of one another. And that's how you see it. Definitely. Uh -huh. Yes, definitely. Yeah. We right. want to hear their stories and we definitely want to help. They, I want people to feel comfortable sharing their experiences. Um, it is a big issue and like you said, it's not as talked about it as it often as it happens. So I think it's important for the youth to step in and definitely take, it, take on this project. So. Seeing also as yes. it's something, a lot of people when they're abused, they don't understand the abuse. You brought that good point. How it happens and they don't say anything, shame silences mm -hmm. them. So just discovering the nuance of what happens when you go through something like that and to be aware of how we can treat each other instead of 
brushing it over, just openly communicating with each other. We're excited. We're excited to hear the episodes, and we look forward to it. <laughs> you well, think about yes. us, Mahmoud and I, we are among the last of the generation that's up and walking around in this community. Mm. And to be able to see that we have young people who are interested in following the tradition of our ancestors of trying to understand what's happening to us and how to address it, what to do about it, so that we can say we're following our ancestral tradition mm -hmm. of caring mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. our people and our elders. Don't you think, Mark? The best you can do. That's right, best we can do. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank thank here's you. to you. <laughs> The Mink Initiative is meant to educate communities to adopt a nonviolent lifestyle in the way in which we were culturally trained by our ancestors to love and care for our elders. We have a big problem in our community with elder abuse. Tell us your story at mnelderonviolence.org or call the Elder Abuse Testifier voicemail at 651-324-9561.